just want to welcome you and invite you to just worship with us. Just praise with us as we lift him up and tell him how good he is.
celebrate uh, Jesus's death. We don't often celebrate death. In fact, we do the opposite. In death, all we see is loss and emptiness. But with Jesus, we know we have so much more. In fact, it is in his death that we gain life. And this morning, if you don't know Jesus Christ, this is your opportunity to, to say, I need that kind of life. You know, it only takes a second. It, it takes that, that acknowledgement that, that you have things in your life that you can't solve and you need a God greater than you to be in relationship with you and to, to deal with what you can't. And so if that's you this morning, all you have to do is reach for Jesus and say, Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for me. I believe that, that you have a plan for my life. I know that I have made mistakes, big ones. Maybe you've even heard those big mistakes called sin. You know you're a sinner. 
but more importantly is that you know that you need a savior and Jesus is the answer to that. All you have to do is reach for him and tell him that, Jesus, I need a savior. I have sinned, I've done wrong. Would you help me today? When you do that, you become a part of God's family. You become his beloved child. You come close to God and he then comes close to you. And you're in good standing, not because you're perfect, not because you've done it all right, but because you belong to Jesus. You have a right to come around this table, this communion table, this moment when we remember Jesus' death. Paul wrote, and said this, for I have received from the Lord, he said, that which I bring unto you. He tells us that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, imagine that, the night that everyone and everything was about to come against him, all of hell was going to be on his back. He was going to experience complete isolation from his heavenly father in the days to come, all for you and I. On that night when he was betrayed, he says, the, Paul says that Jesus took bread. He was at a meal, at a together time with his disciples. And he wanted to give them a sense of, of, of what he was about to do and who he was really deep inside. And so Jesus took the bread and he gave thanks. And I know when we live in time sometimes then, that, that cause us to grumble more than we give thanks. And today as we come around this table, we want to just give thanks to God for his son Jesus who went to the cross for us, for the fact that grace and peace and joy can be ours even in the worst of times. And in those worst times for Jesus, it says he gave thanks and he took the bread and it says that he broke it. Whatever your bread is today, you're not in a church service, but, but you're at home. Maybe, maybe it is a cracker. Maybe it's something else. It really doesn't matter. But what symbolizes for you right in this moment, this body of Jesus? And Jesus said right in that moment, he says, this is my body, which is for you or broken for you. You know, when Jesus went to the cross, it was his will he yielded. We all have wills. Some of us have been known to be strong-willed people. Maybe you were a strong-willed child. But with Jesus, however stubborn or tenacious you believe you are deep inside, that will has to be submitted to Jesus. You see, when God called Jesus to go to the cross, Jesus said to him in the garden, he said, Father, if it be your will, please don't let me go through this hard thing of going to the cross. But he says, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. I believe that God is asking for your will and my will today to be yielded to his will for our lives, his purpose. And as you, you receive the bread, the body of Jesus today, I wonder if you're willing to, to yield yourself again. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for giving the sacrifice of your life on the cross. We thank you for your yielded will for our sake, Lord Jesus, so that we could have complete connection with God. You did it for us. Lord, you know the truth of where we're at with our own will and stubbornness and tenaciousness. Lord, the things that we are strong-willed about, not willing to yield to your will for. Help us to be more like Jesus. Would you forgive us today? Jesus, thank you for yielding your body. We accept that sacrifice and we say thank you. Would you partake with me? The Bible tells us that the next thing Jesus did is he took the cup. This cup is a pretty important thing. In Bible times, the, the concept of a cup was usually the concept of a difficult thing. Going to the cross was not an easy thing. And when Jesus said to, to the Father, God, 
in the garden, he said, if it be your will, let this cup, let this hard thing pass from me. See, it wasn't going to be easy being beaten and bruised. It wasn't going to be easy for, for his blood to, to, to be poured out for us. Because you see what Jesus said to his disciples that night. He says, as he, as he took the cup, this is a new covenant, a new deal, a new contract. And he says, it's going to be written in my blood. It's going to be by my grace. It's not going to be with the, the limitations of legalities. It's, it's better than that. It covers everything. And if you know Jesus today, you know you live under grace. That gift that was given by Jesus' life, Jesus' suffering to you. So that whatever you've done and whatever you do, you don't get what you fully deserve because Jesus already paid for it. And all he's asking of you is to say, forgive me. And when we say forgive me, we stand righteous before God again. Paul also said that as we come before the table and remember Jesus' sacrifice, we have to examine ourselves. We have to look for where we're out of line with God and come back into line. Why? Because he's made the way through his blood sacrifice in Jesus. I wonder if you can take a moment and think about where you're at. Think about the things you've said and done or even thought over the last few days or hours or weeks. Think about those nagging points where God is asking something of you and you're not yielding yourself to it. Before you partake of it, this symbol of his blood, would you lay that before him and ask for forgiveness? Jesus, we thank you for shedding your blood for us, that we could be free, that our sins could be washed away, that we could, could, could have freedom to live, deep inner freedom, freedom from guilt, freedom from accusations, just freedom. And Jesus, I thank you that it's not just freedom we find in you. Even because you suffered physically, we can find healing in you. And Lord, as, as we partake today, those are, that are suffering in their physical bodies, we are asking that you would come and meet them and bring healing, Jesus. Healing to pain and disease. Healing to hearts that are in despair. Healing to those that are in dark places and can't pull themselves out. We declare that by your stripes, your suffering, we can be healed. And we lay hold of that this morning. Would you partake of that with me, his cup? God bless you today. We thank you that you were able to take part with us. And this week, as you step into all that you have to do, remember this, Jesus died for your freedom. Celebrate it. Oh Lord, you satisfy me like nobody else can. Lord, you satisfy so glad to be with you again just to share um, 
the subject of one of the most important and exciting um, accounts in the life of the church, and that's Pentecost. Well, as many of you know, um, for hundreds of years, uh, the Jews had been in bondage and been discriminated against, and, and they were looking for a Messiah, somebody that would get them out of their mess, somebody that would just lay down the law, and a warrior, and, and somebody that would be able, that they could be able to follow. Hence, God had made this wonderful provision of sending himself in the form of flesh, Jesus, to come and live. He was perfect. He was sinless. He was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, as spoken at the beginning of John. And he lived and he died and he rose again for us that we would be able to, to, to live a life that is forgiven of sin. He paid the price for sin. He died and he was resurrected again so that we would have this assurance that we could live forever. That's the gospel of Jesus. That's the good news. It doesn't get any better than that. Or does it? So now, when Jesus was getting ready to leave his disciples, he told them that he would send somebody to give us this power to live. Power to live a life with advantage and power and confidence and boldness. So we're going to take a vantage point from before Pentecost, before the crucifixion, where Jesus was having a dialogue with his disciples. We're going to start at John 14, verse 15 to 17, and then we're going to read verse 25, and we're going to dissect it a little bit and apply it to us this morning. In verse 15, it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. This is all Jesus talking. And he says, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and to be with you forever. The spirit of truth. So here we just get this wonderful promise that Jesus is saying that I am sending someone who will be with you forever. He's going to draw alongside of us. Well, in Romans chapter 8, verses 11, um, we hear the Apostle Paul saying, not only will the Holy Spirit be with us, but the Holy Spirit is in us. That was the promise, and that is the reality for today. So let's keep reading. So in verse 25, Jesus says, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Then he goes on and he talks about the vine and the branches in, 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 in chapter 15. And then he continues in John 16, verses 7 to 11. And he says, but verily, truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people have not believed about righteousness because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer and about judgment 
because the prince of this world now stands condemned. Wonderful, wonderful picture. He's saying that all the garbage in this world, the, the, the evil one that has um, wreaked havoc, he's already condemned. Wonderful truth. The purpose of the Holy Spirit. What, what, what was God thinking? Well, he was thinking that the reason for, for this triune God, the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit was to bring glory to himself. So therefore, if he's with us and living in us, then our purpose for life is to bring glory to God. So what Jesus was saying was, I am going to send the Holy Spirit in power. I'm going to pour it out to you. I'm going to make it available to you. And, and what it's going to do is it's going to give you power. Power, power to do what? Power to live. Power to live like Jesus lived. Power not to be under the bondage of, of sin and of death. Well, do we get it right all the time? No. But because of the Holy Spirit being activated in us, it doesn't have to keep us down. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, the lifestyle of sin can be broken in our lives if we let the Holy Spirit come alongside of us. And if we activate the Spirit living within us, it becomes a, a deal changer. Oh, what about this coming alongside bit? Jesus said, uh, the Holy Spirit, the, the advocate, the, the one who draws alongside, have you ever been lonely? Yeah. Feeling that you're by yourself? Of course. But he said, that's why I'm sending the Holy Spirit to keep you company. One of the other things is um, the Holy Spirit is truth. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. Well, well what is truth? Well, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So when the Holy Spirit is along, allowed to come alongside of us, he will be able to reveal to us what is truth. When, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, he will be able to help us and give us the power and the boldness to act out his truth. One of the other, one, one of the other things is that the Holy Spirit, because he is truth, sometimes truth is convicted. Not condemning, but convicting. And when the Holy Spirit is allowed to be um, worked out and worked through our lives, where it's almost, not almost, it is like we allow ourselves to be possessed by God's Spirit. Then, when he, when he points out wrong to us, when he points out issues, when he points out truths, we just say, well, I am yours, God. And so you got me, and I am going to follow after you. Scriptures does state that when we accept Jesus, that, that his spirit comes in, and lives with us and in us. 
And further on in the chapter of Acts, there was this distinct question that the apostles asked after the day of Pentecost, after God filled his, his people that were there in the upper room. Um, this question went around. I know you believe in Jesus, but have you received the Holy Spirit since you've believed? Which indicates that there is there is a way that we can live as believers and have the Holy Spirit. And yet that, that filling, that indwelling, that, that baptism has not yet taken place. And we're going to, in one of these other vantage points, we're going to look at some of those scriptures in, in Acts. The Apostle Paul says something wonderful in, in, in uh, um, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Um, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live. It's not about me anymore. But it's about Christ who lives in me. What a way to live. What a a victorious position to go through life no matter what's going on during the hard times during the difficult times that we can have this confidence and we can actually walk it out from day to day this confidence of this indwelling power of God's spirit that he left for us to partake in how does the rubber meet the road? We, over the last several weeks, have been challenged as a, as a country that certain things have been exposed. Human injustice. It's a different, difficult one. Racism, discrimination, we have experienced the visuals of a modern day lynching. Difficult for many of us to watch. Reality, it has been going on for many, many years, hundreds of years. But something has pricked us. We got a touch of it in, in 1968. Um, segregation. The world was rocked by that. And today it has reared the visibility of its ugly head. I know this has been difficult for those that have been oppressed, people of different ethnicities have been the victims on it, of it. It's been difficult for the dominant culture. Many are unaware. Many have experienced privilege that has helped to not understand the situation. I heard a definition of, of, of privilege or an explanation, let me call it that. And it says privilege is when you think something is not a problem because you're not affected personally. Reality, um, I always knew that, that my accent was different. Many of you probably, if you didn't know that before, you're just getting it. And, 
because of my accent, it does not mean that I have not encountered racism, discrimination, and all of the nuances that come with it. I have had to have difficult conversations with my children, how to manage it. We've had difficult conversations of where can I go, where can I not go, what should they wear, what shouldn't they wear, when they are in certain situations um, with law enforcement, what are some of the things that they need to do ahead of time to de-escalate any possible series of events. I'm just being transparent with you. The other reality is that everyone in our family, the Johnson family, has experienced a myriad of issues that have come from racism, discrimination. The reality though, that all of this is on the backdrop of the reality of fallen man. We are broken and we have been broken from the beginning. The bigger reality is the spiritual one. And that one is sad too because in the church, the people of God, we have it in, in our church buildings as believers it's alive and well. Some are aware, some are not. The reality is silence also means consent. What are we gonna do? Well, another reality is that from a spiritual perspective, this is sin. Reality number two, if the people of God don't get it right, Neither will the world. However, I am so hopeful because as God's people begin to draw on what we don't have, which, or no, let me correct that. If we as God's people activate the asset that Jesus left for us in the person of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing that he can't do. So you're going to say, well, um, Pastor Paul, I get that perhaps it could be an issue. Um, and I love Jesus. And this thing has helped me see some things that I never 
saw before. So, uh, so give, give me a couple of steps. I can do it and everything will be just okay. Well, I want to let you know that it's going to take more than that. Well, well, let's, let's have think tanks and round tables and discussions in our communities and in our churches. And I say, yeah, that's really good. But I think that's step two. You see, the reality is for God's people, we are going to have to look inwardly at ourselves. I just want to give you um, an acrostic for self. And, and perhaps that will help us remember maybe God's order on this. And so if you can see the word self, the first letter is S. Well, the first letter S I chose the word seek. Seek, well, seek what? Well, for the believer, as I looked at 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, it, and, and it's Jesus speaking after the tabernacle, the temple of Solomon was built, and, and God himself says, when I shut up heaven, so that there was no rain, or commanded locusts to devour the land, or sent a plague among my people. Verse 14 says this. If my people, my people, you know what? That's you and me. Who are called by my name, God says. You and I are. Will humble themselves and pray. Oh, oh. Yeah, will humble themselves and pray. And seek, there's the word, my face. And turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. Although conversation is important, although though dialogue is important, I believe that this is the first step for the church. We have sinned. We've missed the mark. We, we didn't know, some of us, didn't know that the church in some ways had been propagating segregation and not caring for human justice. God, would you forgive us? Next letter. So first one is seek. Second one is empathy. Well, for empathy, God has to change our hearts. God has to give us, turn our hearts of stone into a brokenness. It's been said that unless you walk a mile in a man's shoes, you don't understand. I believe God is call, calling us, calling the church to empathize. So many times you hear the phrase that Jesus was moved with compassion. You see, the church has to realize and actualize that justice for the unborn is as important as human justice. I'm reminded of that troubling passage, Matthew 25, where it talks about the sheep and the goats. Read it sometime. It's troubling. So 
So we've got seek, we've got empathy. The next one is listen and learn. This is a difficult one because even in the church we have the perspective that we know. We, we know, or some of you might be listening to this and say, oh, come on, Pastor Paul, I, don't you think you're being a little dramatic? Are you just getting on the protest bandwagon? Well, no. Because when we look at Scripture, changes our perspective. So many of us that are believers do not know that we don't know. I'm going to say that again. So many of us that are believers don't know that we don't know. Meaning that we are ignorant about a topic, about the plight of the situation, and we don't know that we are. I think God is wanting us, well, I'm being polite, I'm sure that God is wanting us to get to the point where we can say to him and say to one another, especially those of the dominant culture, I know something's going on here, but I don't know what to do. Almost like saying, I'm at the place where I know that I don't know. What humility is that? And when we fall on our face before God and says, God, I now know that I don't know, would, would you help me? Would you allow me to listen? Would you allow me to learn and not be quick to say, oh, no, no, that's not what it is. Just listen because there's a great possibility that you don't know. The last word, so we've got, we've got seek, we've got empathy, we've got listen and learn, and, and the fourth one is focus. Focus. Don't get distracted by the noise. We all like magic tricks and the sleight of hand. And it's amazing that it can be sometimes difficult to keep our eye on the ball. Example, somebody pulls a temper tantrum. Let's call it a child. But how many of us adults have ever pulled a temper tantrum? And we get mad and we'll kick the dog or we'll punch the wall and, and then we got to get a repairman in to fix the wall, take the dog to the vet. And it's so easy to focus on how dare him kick the dog. How dare him put a hole in the wall and now we got to get a contractor in to fix it. Versus saying, what was behind what that person did in frustration in rage. We have seen um, peaceful protests. We have seen not so peaceful protests. We have seen looting and, and vandalism. And we have seen even, even um, uh, victimization of some of our law enforcement where some have actually lost their lives. This is injustice. This is wrong 
and justice must be served. And with that, we must keep our eyes on the ball and not let those issues disqualify or devalue the real 400 year issue. In conclusion, but there's hope. If we will address this, begin this from 2 Chronicles 7.14, God will do what we can't do. God will do the supernatural. This morning, I want to pray. There's some of you listening here that, that will say, man, that was a heavy one, Pastor Paul. As a matter of fact, I don't know if I know who Jesus is. Well, you know what? I want to tell you that you've come to the right place because Jesus is the answer to these issues. This is why he died because of broken humanity. So, if you would like to say, Jesus, I, I want to give this a try because I'm a mess too. All you have to do is pray and say, Jesus, I want to be a part of your family. I know I've messed up. Please forgive me. And as a matter of fact, this, this other person that I heard talked about, the Holy Spirit, would you like, like drench me in your Holy Spirit so that I can have the power not to be a wimp, but a warrior? The sixth, second group of people is you that are believers. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, pressure. Because it depends on you and me. And we can't do it in ourselves. We've been trying to do it in ourselves. We've got the polite thing down. But in so many ways, our heart still needs work. And unless we say, Holy Spirit, would you come and drench me? in your power and in your love. We are going to continue to be a mess and the world is gonna show for it. Let's pray. Father God, I, I thank you for that person that's listening that just says, man, it sounds like you are hope. Jesus, would you just fill their hearts and assure them that they have made the best decision in their lives to give their life to you, to confess their sin and want to be new. Father, for your, your church, your church that has done um, amazing things in your name and, and then your church that has let some negative things carry on for hundreds of years. God, would you wash us afresh? Your spirit and your oil. Would you make us new by the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can so represent you on the earth and bring you glory. Forgive us now, God. We thank you and we love you. Thank you for your provisions that you have given us to live a victorious life. In Jesus' name, amen. 
thank you all for being here. We hope that you got something that you needed. Um, if you need any help in your faith journey or your walk with Jesus at all, please let us know. That's why we're here. I just want to remind you to remember to give during this time. You can give um, online at tgplace.net. You can also give by mail or drop it off at the office anytime. Thank you again for being here, and we all hope to see you next time.